Hello and welcome to this episode of Demystified as we explore home cooking in a modern world. Hello, welcome to this episode of Demystified. I'm Linda and I'm here with my friend Paul. Hello Paul. Hello Linda. And I think today Paul, it'll be great to follow on from our podcast we talked about pantry essentials we've had a lot of response to that podcast and particularly as we are seemingly in an endless survival mode mentality where the locusts are out depopulating all the shelves of food the freezers of food and uh yeah well yeah i, how I mean how hard it is to get things from you know your local supermarket I don't know what the uh, the title of this podcast will end up being, but I'm hopeful it'll be Cooking in the Apocalypse or something like that. Um, although it's flippant, it's probably got you listening, which is a good thing. Um, and well, I'm not being flippant, actually, to be honest. Um, a few things that probably I want to um, you know touch on is obviously people are, are buying a lot of ingredients and doing a lot of shopping. Um, and... What I will say is, from my perspective, people are buying the wrong thing. I know, so you've, I know you've been to shops and yep. you've seen people wheeling out trolleys yep. for their home yep. of 25 kilo bags of flour. Yeah. And okay. multiple it's, of them. Yeah, and, yeah. And big tins of food. Yeah. And I, I have no, like, I'm not here to, you know, criticise people or tell people that they shouldn't do it. Whatever makes them feel comfortable. But... Um, from a food perspective, I actually think they're buying the wrong thing. I read an article just last night, actually, which highlighted the things which are being left on the shelves of supermarkets um, and on the shelves of markets. Um, and two things which I noted, and one in particular, which I'll talk about now, which I noted was being left behind. So all other pre-prepared meals, let's park those for a second and and fruit and vegetables and all that sort of stuff, there was one thing in there that was left behind which I went, oh my God, how can we not be buying that? And these are the things that I would buy. Um, so one of the most popular things to not buy at the moment, because everything's popular, is beetroot. And really? I was, yeah. So people are not buying beetroot. So I've seen images of supermarkets and markets where they're being cleaned out of a lot of stuff but beetroot's not there. Now, the one thing I will say is, okay, think about what you're buying, but not only think about the volume of what you're buying, and we talked about pickling and making relishes and all that sort of stuff, but, but think about the ingredients that you're using within that. Um, beetroot is one of the best things for your immune system. Now, I'm not saying that it's a cure, okay, for what's going on at the moment, but it is one of the best things for your blood, for your immune system. It is one of the best of it tasting vegetables going around as well. Um, and it's the thing that no one's buying. Um, we also commented before on um, people buying mass amounts of things like flour and dry ingredients and dry goods. Uh, and that's fine. But I also want you to consider, or I want people to consider, is... When was the last time you had a 20 kilo bag of flour at home? Oh, that'd be never. Yeah, very, very rarely. I mean, in commercial kitchens back in the day, it, it's a common thing. In bakeries, like they use probably 10 times that per day. But at home, um, how often do you do it? You buy a kilo of flour when you need it, really. Um, you kind of, it's, it's one of those ingredients that, oh, I've got to make a cake. And you get all the ingredients and you go, oh, I'm out of flour. So you just whip down and buy a kilo of flour or even half a kilo of flour. Now people, I've seen people walking out with 25, sometimes 50 kilos of flour. What I would say to people is, besides the environmental impact that that is having, as far as sustainability and sharing it between other human beings, what I would say is that you're going to struggle to keep it and get through it. Because I guarantee you that 99% of that flour that's put, bought in those bulk volumes um, will end up with weevils. Well, certainly, Paul. I think at the moment, sustainability and caring for our community are 
two things yeah. which the locusts, as I'm affectionately calling them, yeah. aren't. It's not on their radar. No, they're they're panic buying for for the fear that they feel for yeah. a number of reasons, but they are feeling fear and they are pulling food off the shelves willy nilly. Yeah, and and as you said, you know, for what? In vast they're, amounts. The funniest thing was, I mean, I was at, I saw you there. We were at the market. Uh, the other morning and we were there what a good 45 minutes before the market opened I think um, and it, it, there was already droves of people there and everyone was in the meat section yes like the vast majority of people were in the meat or poultry section so in Melbourne Australia at the moment there's apparently a mince shortage um, I then bought and I bought some fish we, I, bought, we yeah. bought some mince yeah. and we I then, bought some meat and some I, poultry. I then walked to the fresh fruit and vegetable section and there was no one there. No. Oh, well. There was very, there was, there was maybe 5% of the people there that were in the butcher section, if you like, at the market. So there was very few people buying fresh fruit and vegetables and what they're doing is stocking up on meat and poultry and things like that now I understand that that's fine and you can uh, freeze those things down and appliance manufacturers at the moment will tell you that the run out on chest freezers and freezers and refrigerators is extraordinary um, because people are in that panic mode yeah, and, and the power that they would be drawing on your home yeah, yeah. but there's there's very little in the in the way of fresh fruit and vegetables I mean there is still of course people are still buying a lot but of course, they're not buying as much because they don't see life in it like they do being able to freeze chicken. The thing is, is I think, as we all know, fruit and vegetables are high on the list of what you should consume a lot of every day. And we know also that they don't keep as well. But if you know how to keep them and you know what to do with them, you can make things. And then if you are in that mode of trying to stockpile food... Um, you can make things and then you, you can take your vegetables, turn it into something else and freeze that. So you'll also, I also want to sort of note that um, because of this mass buying of things like poultry and especially red meat being beef, lamb and pork to a degree, but I didn't see as much pork, but the, the bulk buying of that, while good for your freezer, prices are now increasing dramatically. Um, it's, if we take mince as an example, the problem with mince is, is that all the offcuts that generally go into mince, everyone's minced it and it's all gone. And so now they're having to mince more premium cuts and the price of mince is now tripled. What I would suggest to people is that if you are going to go to the butcher and you see a brazing cut of meat, just because it isn't minced doesn't mean you can't do something similar with that. So if you're going to make a ton of bolognese sauce which is a staple in a lot of people's houses if you want to make several kilos of that with the mince that you hoarded for want of a better term um, the same principle can be applied to a piece of braising steak or meat dice it up yourself and you might need to cook it longer but I guarantee you will get a better end result because it's much better than actually buying pre-prepared mince so you're doing the same thing. Uh, you're getting almost the same result. It's just not minced. So just maybe take a bit of a take a bit of a moment and think about just because it isn't minced and someone hasn't put it through a mincer for your convenience doesn't mean that you can't make that recipe anymore. And I suppose that comes down to other conversations we've we've had about recipe adaptation. Is a braised ragu, if you like, done with onion, garlic oregano tomato like you would a bolognese sauce just because it's got diced beef in it rather than or beef and pork or whatever it might be just because it's got diced in it rather than minced yes you'll have to cook it for a bit longer but you're going to get the same result so i just encourage people we can't stop people f the the pack from doing this but if you're just a bit smarter maybe just have a look at what else is available and what no one's buying because that's all good food. 
it's all good food and, and you can adapt what you know and the principles of what you know to other cuts of meat. Now, when it comes to vegetables, um, I did it for you just the other day. I went and bought two capsicums, two or three capsicums, a little bit of zucchini, some eggplant, a couple of onions, uh, and a jar of passata sauce. And I just made some ratatouille. Like, but I'm using fresh vegetables. Now, ratatouille freezes well. You pull it out. It can be a meal of its own. In provincial uh, France, it is. Um, they just have ratatouille and bread. But of course, it can be the base of other dishes. It can be, also, you know, it can be anything that you want it to be. But I prefer to take the route of maybe buying and looking at what other people aren't buying. Don't follow the pack. Go outside of it and... Don't think that you're not going to be able to make what you regularly make. We know home cooks are very habitual creatures and they want to do their dishes their way. And in these times when things become, I hate to use the word scarce, but it's not because they are scarce, it's because people are struggling to keep up with deliveries. That's that's about the problem. Um, have a look at alternatives. There are plenty of good alternatives out there which you can use to get similar results. Well, there's a couple of things you've said there, Paul. I, I know when I saw you at the market when Dougie and I were shopping, we got there early and it was a bit busy, but there was plenty, hmm. plenty in every in every one of those outlets for all the and there was a lot of pork yeah. for sale. It was busy, but it, there was plenty of food, and they get it fresh every day. Yeah, and yeah, the prices are going up, but there was, you know, people were were buying a variety and stocking up. It's interesting is what you say about beetroot, and and I think mainly people don't think of beetroot as a non-summer item. We're we're used to having it in salads, yeah, and maybe if you're lucky on a hamburger. Well, it's kind of like we don't have it. yeah, it's you don't quite yeah. Have it with it. You don't tend to have it warmed or as part of anything else, and maybe that's you know we. Could... Oh, I mean, it depends. I mean, a lot of countries, it's a you know Russia is a major oh, yeah. you know, but. but, but in, Things like, um, Australia. yeah, so things like, let's say cauliflower. I mean, what you're talking about is, is we cook things that we think are in season. So it gets cold and we get into winter and uh, it gets nice and cold. And so what do we want to eat? We want to eat warm roast vegetables, let's say, right? And everyone thinks, oh, cauliflower is a good thing to roast. And da-da-da. Cauliflower is a summer vegetable. It's be- it, it does grow all year round, but its best price when it's in season is actually, when it's properly in season, is actually in summer. But cauliflower sales skyrocket in winter because everyone considers it a winter vegetable. It's not that they're not educated about when the seasons are. It's just what's sort of built into people is when the right time to eat that is. Because cauliflower is a hard one because you kind of go, oh, I don't- you know, it's a bit of a, it's a, probably a bulky, heavier vegetable than, let's say, broccoli. It's a similar family. But everyone kind of goes, oh, okay, I might make some cauliflower soup or I might do some roasted cauliflower. And it's actually a, a summer vegetable. Um, so, you know, I'm always trying to promote buying what's in season. At the moment, that's also, I've got to say, flown out the window. Um, the seasonality of things has sort of gone by the wayside just in... The, well, just so people can get as much as possible. But like you say, particularly in Australia, and we can't speak for the rest of the world, but in Australia, we export uh, like 75% of what we produce here. That's how much we have. Like we're pretty fortunate. So when it comes to anyone that has decided to do bulk shopping or buy in bulk or hoard or whatever you want to call it, if they are listening... There is plenty of food. And if you actually work outside of just your local supermarket and go and visit a market, you can see it. You can also see it in a lot of the shops around as well. Yeah. They, their lifeblood is getting supplies and they often make produce as well. So there's a little parcel place up the road from us that there were queues out the door as you saw and we get our lunch yeah. there. So we were like, well, we're not going that day to get a roll. But, but if we but if we look at something like butchers, right? And what what I've found interesting about this is is let's say a butcher's department within a major supermarket chain. Back in the day, 
and I don't want to sound too old, but back in the day, they would actually, they had a butcher's room and they hired butchers and they got in whole carcasses. But now everything is done offsite. Everything is vacuum sealed and packaged elsewhere. So they're relying on those deliveries. They're not relying on having whole carcasses there. If you've got a whole carcass, there's so much more you can do with it. And you're not relying on just selling a premium cut or mince or whatever it is. If they needed mints, they could cut something off an animal and mince it for you. So you go up to the markets now and they've got whole carcasses hanging there waiting to be portioned out, distributed, however however possible. But it gives them freedom of what cuts is available, what, what you can do with those cuts. If you want to ask a butcher to mince something for you, that's where you go because they have a whole animal there. Like the supermarkets are... All of that stuff is happening off-site and it's happening two, three, four, five days before it's actually arriving at your location, like your local, because it's got to be actually done and then packed and then, you know, packed into a truck and then driven and then dropped off and then unpacked and then put on the shelves. Um, So the delay in getting things into those big retail chain supermarkets is three, four days. Go to a market and you're more likely to be able to see a whole carcass hanging up there, get someone to cut some off for you or whatever scraps they've got or whatever you need. But you can actually specifically ask, oh, I need you know, a couple of hundred grams of mints. It's pretty scarce. They will have more off cuts than what a supermarket will to be able to deal with making mints if need be. Hmm. That's interesting. And, and sadly, Paul, I, I suspect that a lot of people who are those who are panic buying who are really worried and buying excessive amounts of food aren't actually cooking it yeah so i can't see anyone using well we, the, and i think i think the proof of that is in how not busy the fruit and vegetable section was must be because well, if they if they if they're buying what they what they seem to be what people seem to be buying is the dry goods the dry stores the pasta um tinned foods all of that sort of stuff now if you are in a situation where and this is a health driven crisis for want of a better term what's the best thing for your health fresh fruit and vegetables like and we don't have a problem with sourcing it we don't have a problem with getting it like but that's the thing that's selling less and i'm not certainly not um like plant-based advocate but there is I would say there is an abundance of fresh fruit and vegetables and people aren't buying that because they think it's not going to exist or uh, because they don't want to cook and the only thing that can last is something in a tin like it's just well after we saw you at the meat section we went to the deli section they were fully stocked Yeah, they had a great supply of cold meats that were there for yeah for everyone, plenty of produce. And we went to the little veggie shop on the way out to the car park near where we parked. And they were doing a good turnover. They were stocking and they had yeah. um, some things that were getting a bit depleted. But that's, I think, because of its location. And um, so we didn't go into the main area at all, other than to get... Dougie got a coffee for us yeah. as his uh, treat. But but we bought, three, we bought four items and some some deli items and because of the way we cook yeah i've i bought some mints and it's made enough pasta sauce for three and i only bought 500 grams yeah but we've made it for three different meals yeah and i don't want to like repeat myself but if you can't get mints no look at something else and apply the same theory to it and but you you don't need a lot to make a fair amount of food and I mean, the amount of the, the amount of food that's being bought at the moment is um, like there is no way that people are going to get through this amount of food. I mean, a lot of this stuff I would predict would end up being freezer burnt uh, by the end that. of it and, and put in They're the and put into landfill. Away. Like They're thrown away. And Look. there are people out there that are far. I mean, far worse off. Uh, there are countries that are far worse off than we are here, um, and it's. Like yeah. I mean, it's sad, but I think if we try and rather than be downers about the whole thing, I think hopefully um, what this also will do is show people that 
they actually don't need a lot to get by. Um, to make a family meal, you don't need 19,000 ingredients and, you know, massive volumes of them. Um, and I also think if we try and take another positive from it, it's kind of people are feeling like they're kind of forced a bit to cook at home. And I don't think it's a bad thing. I mean, uh, like, I certainly don't want people to not go to restaurants or pubs or anything like that anymore. I think the hospitality industry is far too important. But um, I think just because of what's happened uh, and the way it's sort of rolling out globally, I think people are going to be cooking more at home. So is that a good thing? I don't think it's a bad thing at all. Um, And it might give them more understanding of what happens when you go to a restaurant how much work and effort goes into when you buy your meal and why you pay $40 for a main course because that just doesn't pay for the ingredients but it pays for the chef that cooks it, the dishwasher, the plate, the knife and fork, the waiter, everything. So maybe it'll give people a little bit, hopefully, I mean, maybe on rose-coloured glasses here, but it might give people a little bit more appreciation for, you know, the effort that goes into making food if they are forced to do it themselves. Well, I'm hoping that we can pass on some of the skills we talked about last time in the pantry essentials of how to make stock, how to how to take food and use it in a different way. How, as you said before, how to maybe use some lamb or beef cuts in a different way to make a ragu, yeah. to cook it slower, to, to spend some time preparing food, particularly if we do get into a lockdown situation. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I mean, people are going to have time if that's the know, case. I don't know. Apart from one notable fifteen-year-old exception in our in our life, I don't know a lot of the other younger people have had the time or the skills imparted to them on how to do that. Yeah, well, maybe that's true. I mean, and it, maybe they'll get into it. I mean, who Hopefully. knows? Yeah, it Wouldn't might be. be great? A, it might be a, um, you know, it might be a sort of boom time for food and for home cooking, which I. Like well, I think is basics, it, yeah. How to, how to make custard, basics how to, like how to make bread. I mean, if people are buying fifty kilos of flour, I don't like. What are they doing with it? They've got to make bread at some stage, and maybe you're not experienced with it. Maybe you need some help. I mean, bread or gnocchi are the two things I can think of. Maybe, but not even that much pasta. Yeah, well, I mean, bread yeah, and pasta, pasta, but yeah. But even so, you know, I think it'd be great for people, for the younger people, to learn maybe time to do some planting in your gardens yeah. to go look at the different vegetables that are at the, that are in abundance at the moment and yeah. really fresh and fantastic yeah things like um, the other one that I didn't mention before was kohlrabi which is another one that people are leaving off on the shelves like that's a fantastic super versatile vegetable you can eat it raw you can roast it you can blanch it there's a whole heap of things you can do with it so just because you might be unfamiliar with it and you can't get because of other people you can't get what you're used to don't panic don't worry about it buy what's in abundance because you'll be the smart one because it'll be cheaper it'll be more commonly available and you know what in these times quite in the not too distant past i listened i did a little bit of work with a very well-known uh australian i want to say icon being gabrielle gatte and he did a we did a presentation together and the one thing he said to me that has stuck with me, he said, home cooks, like I said before, are habitual. So they'll do 10 to, you know, eight to 10 different recipes. He said, if you learn one new recipe a week, that's 50 a year. Your repertoire, like that's one a week, that's nothing. Even if you learn one every fortnight, that's 25 recipes plus, give or take, the tendon you've already got. So your repertoire opens up and the more you learn stuff like that, and it's just like any skill, the more you practice and learn with cooking, the better that you'll be. If people did one recipe a fortnight, they'd be better cooks. Regardless of whether they screw it up or not, they will be better cooks. But we don't do it. No, absolutely. And especially now with everyone got all those ingredients, they're going to have to use them. If it goes in the bin, like I'll be just... Oh, devastating that's, but that's sadly what it's I another think is topic. happening but sadly which mm. is uh, where we're heading with that but I also think getting back to your point about learning how to cook a different recipe if you're not if you're going into your local stores into your local butcher or your local green grocer 
and you're not sure about how to cook something, ask them. Yeah. They would love to help. Yeah, butchers are pr- butchers are pretty good. Greengrocers are really good with understanding exactly those fruits and vegetables that you might not know, um, and then you might not have a understanding about how to how to use them. Fruit and veg guys are really good because generally you're not going to find a lot of like twenty year olds running a fruit and veg shop. They'll generally be older and it will be a family business and they will have done it for a long time and look not to can the big retail supermarkets but the guys that work in the fruit and veg section of a retail supermarket are shelf stackers and they maybe don't have the experience in understanding what to do with those things which is go to a market they will know and they will tell you butchers really know butchers some of the butchers I know are really really good cooks like they'll tell you their version of how to do the perfect steak. Everyone's got their own, but all the if, roast. If, yeah, all the all roast. roast. But if you're if you're in, you know all that you've got in front of you is goat meat, they can explain it to you. Exactly, and I'm not saying avoid the supermarkets, but at the no. moment we want to avoid the supermarkets because they're well, they're struggling. too hectic. Yeah, and they can't and keep up. And the poor staff. I mean, yeah. everywhere they everywhere you go. People, are, the staff in in these places are looking shell shocked and abused, and yeah, you know, give them a break. Yeah, absolutely. You know, but I think that's some great advice, and and hopefully there'll be a lot of people now learning to cook in the way that we didn't have sports when we were kids. It was just not on the agenda for our family. Well, so Saturday afternoon, well, you did, but yeah. because you're naturally sporty, but. In our family, it was growing up where we did, it was really just cooking at home and playing games. And so we did learn cooking, you know, they were passed down from my grandmother to us. And I need to have a chat to your grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go there, Paul. <laughs> but we, ha- we, can, we can survive this. Yeah. We can feed ourselves and our families and provide good quality food and hopefully not too much wastage, because that is the thing that's going to break our hearts, is how much of this ends up in landfill. And just think about what you're buying before you're buying it. Just because everyone's buying mints doesn't mean it's the right thing. Just because everyone's doing it, it doesn't mean it's the right thing. And I almost guarantee you that if you are forced to buy something other than mints, let's say some stewing beef, like it's the most unattractive sort of sign that you'll see in the butcher shop stewing beef but I guarantee you that if you treat that in a similar way that you do your mince where you're making a bolognese sauce some sort of you know braise maybe not great for tacos or anything like that but certainly you could just braise it I bet you any money that you will no longer buy mince is stewing steak the same as chuck steak, which is my favourite? Yeah, but well, it's the similar. It's yeah. like, really? You've got to call it chuck. Yeah, and Seriously. similar. Like, they, they can be from similar parts, but they are all what we term as secondary cuts. So they're not a primary cut. So it's not a seal it on the barbecue or seal it in a pan and it's nice and beautiful and tender. They are braising, long, slow cooking cuts and they are much better. Mince is all sorts. Mm. Mince is all sorts of all sorts of parts of all sorts of things. Like if I was right now wanting to go and do a you know a really good bolognese sauce for a lasagna, mince would be the last thing that I'd buy. I'd For be buying yes. I'd be buying veal shanks, oxtail, stewing beef, and putting all of that together in a pot with all the regular other ingredients, and I might spend another hour or an hour and a half or two hours cooking it but I bet you a million dollars that my bolognese sauce is better than yours I bet you that even if I had those ingredients and you were using mince Paul but but that's just the way it rolls here yeah well thank you for that Paul I think we've talked about a few things and hopefully given our listeners another way of looking at the fresh fruit and veggies that are still in abundance yeah and a different way of looking at and look at what's in your garden too like, don't forget what's yeah. in your garden. Exactly. So happy cooking, everybody. Good Cheers. luck. Cheers. Bye. Ya. Thanks for listening to this podcast as we explore home cooking in a modern world. We'd love you to subscribe. And for more information, please go to our website, cookingwithsteam.com. Mm-hmm.